Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is a live joint conversation from Nebraska Medicine and UNMC about the Omicron variant of COVID-19. I'm Kayla Thomas, and today I am joined by two of our experts, Dr. Mark Rupp, who is our Chief of Infectious Diseases, and Dr. Armando de Alba, who is with the UNMC College of Medicine. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. We have a ton of questions, and we haven't even started opening it up live yet. Kayla, thanks so much for uh, having me involved. Uh, really great. You appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity as well. And just a quick disclaimer before we get started. This is a live chat. It's for informational purposes only. If you have any questions specific to your own health or medical condition, you do want to, of course, direct those towards your primary care provider. All right, gentlemen, let's start with this. Omicron is different. We knew that the variants were going to change and this was going to evolve. Dr. Rupp, Dr. Dialba, you've been telling us these things all along. So what makes this variant so different and so concerning? Well, Kayla, I'll go ahead and get started on that. And, um, you know, I think you point out correctly that, uh, you know, these emergence of variants is, is something that we've expected all along. And we've obviously seen multiple variants uh, that people had trouble keeping up with at first because they had these funky numbers. And then they started using the Greek alphabet. And I, I hope we don't run out of Greek alphabet letters, but uh, we could. The Omicron variant, uh, you know, was first described down in South Africa, kind of late in November, and it has just exploded. Um, you know, it really is much more transmissible than other variants, and that became painfully obvious, as within days of its first description, it was being described more widely in South Africa, more widely in the region, and then within just weeks, it was really worldwide. And we've seen the same thing here in the United States where it uh, you know, has come on and it's doubling time seems to be about two days or so. So this is almost a logarithmic um, sort of exponential spread that we're seeing in the US. And you know, um, clearly it is the predominant strain here in Nebraska. Now it has mutations in a number of areas that predict uh, its, its characteristics and its behavior. So it's more transmissible. It has lots of mutations in what we call the spike protein, which allows it to interact with human cells. We think this is why it's able to bind more avidly or transmit more easily between humans. Um, there's also some interesting characteristics that were uh, described where it seems to um, proliferate more in the upper airways and not so much in the lower airways. And so this might explain this phenomenon that we're seeing of of potentially more mild disease. But I don't wanna get people the wrong idea. Uh, when we look at it on a population basis, this is very, very serious. And the sheer numbers of cases that we see coming through the community will predict for a greater number overall of hospitalizations, even though percentage-wise, it may be less requirement of hospitalization, severe dis death and disease. Um, just a few other things before I ask uh, Dr. Dalba if he has wants to add anything is that, um, you know, the, the vaccine, particularly if you've been boosted, appears to be protective against severe disease, hospitalization, and death, even with the Omicron variant. And so it's really important for people to do that and non-pharmacologic interventions, you know, really rise to the fore. Yes, and thank you for the opportunity. I would like to just to add that it is also important that we keep into consideration that our kids are being impacted by this Omicron. So we need to protect them. A lot of, the kid, a lot of kids yet are not um, a qualified to receive the vaccines, especially those who are younger than five years. So we need to uh, take seriously and follow the, pre the preventive methods in order to protect them. So we see in our hospitals that the, the kids are uh, getting uh, sick with this new virus and hospitalizations are increasing significantly among these populations. So um, I just wanted to add that. Masks have become a hot topic again because very quickly as we saw the surge of Omicron, we heard those cloth masks just aren't as effective. So why is that? And what do we need to consider when we are masking up if we're going out in public? I, I would like to take that question if that is okay. So um, in general words, we need to consider that the masking has two main functions. One is to prevent that a person who is infected passes the virus to other people. And second, 
is that uh, to prevent that a person can inhale the virus or get infected with the virus. So uh, in, in, in these times with Omicron, when it's highly contagious, that we know now that it's highly contagious at the start and that SARS-CoV-2 is an airborne, the quality of the mask that we use really matters. So that's why we are actually now recommending to go with a higher grade of protection, you know, like surgical mask, N95 when possible, or KN95, because when we look at the studies and we compare them with cloth masks or bandanas, those masks uh, are very, offer very little protection compared, with, compared to the surgical mask and the N95. So these are general principles that we, that why we are recommending now this, this kind of mask. And it is important that we, that we look for those masks also that cover or, or anatomically your face, because it's important that we, uh, you know, also protect the areas where there, there might be some holes. So these are just general principles. And Dr. Mark, uh, Rob, would you like to add anything else that I'm missing? Um, yeah, the only thing I would add to that, Dr. Dalva, is that, um... You know, like we've seen with all of the previous variants of um, COVID-19, people are most infectious um, just before they get ill, if they're going to develop symptoms. And they can be very mild, uh, have asymptomatic even illness, and be shedding large amounts of virus. And so I think that some people, you know, have this idea, okay, I'm going to put on a mask if I start having cold symptoms or I start to cough and therefore I'll protect everybody. Or if I see somebody who's, you know, got a runny nose or sneezing, then I'll put my mask on and protect myself. That just isn't going to work with this variant in particular. It is very transmissible. The incubation period appears to be shorter. So it's going from person to person to person very, very quickly. And it's just really important for us to do these non-pharmacologic interventions as Dr. Dalba said, with a, the best, uh, you know, best fitting, uh, best constructed respiratory protection that you can have. So, um, you know, uh, multi-layers, well-constructed, fitting tightly to the face is really what we're looking for, as well as people showing good judgment uh, when they're out in public. You know, avoid those high-risk settings, uh, particularly here over the next few weeks. I know that people are really tired of hearing this, but this is really important right now at this juncture for the next few weeks that we really buckle down and, you know, we start to show some good judgment. So crowding into your favorite restaurant or bar or going to your favorite sports facility, probably not the good thing to do right now. Give it a few weeks and then hopefully we'll see this peak come down quickly and then maybe people will be able to lighten up just a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Up. I do want to mention quickly for those of you watching live on Facebook, we are taking your questions. I have already compiled a list of some of the most common things we've been seeing. Um, this is being carried across several channels, so we're trying to monitor most of them, um, but feel free to put those in comments and we'll get to them as quickly as we can. So obviously the transmissibility is makes this hugely concerning, but something else that makes Omicron concerning uh, is the lack of treatment. Some of the things that we've seen for the previous variant aren't quite working here. Can you go into a little in depth about that and explain what the problem is there, Dr. Rupp? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is a very important thing for people to understand that um, even though they may have been reading about some of these new medications that are coming out, that um, you know they're in such desperate short supply that they're for the most part are not gonna be available to people to rescue them uh, if they get ill. And so what we're seeing with Omicron is that uh, some of the monoclonal antibodies that people have heard about that have been developed over the last year, year and a half, um, are not effective against Omicron. Uh, the, the virus has shifted and those monoclonals just don't interact with the virus any longer. They're not going to be effective. There is one monoclonal called citrovimab that is effective, but we have very, very few doses of that. Uh, we're only able to give here at the medical center about four to five people per day, uh, that infusion. And we have dozens of folks who qualify for it. So we're just, you know, we're giving it only to those people who are at highest risk of progression of disease. There's also another uh, monoclonal that has a very long lasting effect uh, called Evusheld. That's a combination of a couple of these monoclonals. Again, very, very few doses of that. We in our system, we estimate that we have somewhere around nine to 10,000 patients that would qualify for it. We're only able to give about 50 of those doses per day to try to prevent illness. So this isn't treatment, this is prevention. 
And then people have heard about some of these oral medications that have come out. Uh, Paxlovid uh, is a medicine and molnupiravir. People may have heard about both of these. Uh, very, very few doses. And so we're just not able to, to treat most people. And then the last one that I would mention is remdesivir, which is effective in preventing the progression of disease, but it has to be given intravenously over three days. And so logistically, it's really, really difficult, as you can imagine, to get somebody into an infusion center to give them doses uh, for three days in a row to try to prevent progression of disease. Again, we're reserving this for the most highest risk people. So, um, you know, the best thing to do is prevent the disease in the first place by getting your booster. And then second, don't put yourself in harm's way. This is a question we've been hearing a lot of, and one of our viewers just typed it, I think, in the perfect phrasing. Since the variant is less severe, some people may think it's best to just get infected to get immunity. Is that a fair thing to say, or is it best not to get COVID at all? And will basically everyone get the variant at this point? What should we be expecting? I know we're hearing more and more breakthrough cases this time, and people who we thought maybe would never get it because they were being so careful have gotten it. That's what I'm seeing in my own personal life. So basically, what's your response to that? Yeah, Armando, why don't you take that one first? Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, I would like to start with the concept of these famous a herd immunity. We cannot depend about, I mean, depend on herd immunity. That's actually inhumane because if we depend on herd immunity, a lot of people will die. And we know that the virus, uh, the Omicron is highly contagious. So the more people get infected, the more people will actually, will probably have this severe disease according to the math and the projections that we're having. And we will see our healthcare system being packed. And when we talk about severity, I want to see it also from the broader perspective. What do we mean by severity? You know, because we look at from the healthcare, healthcare, healthcare system perspective, this is very, very bad. And we haven't experienced something like this, like Omicron. So this can be very, actually, a day scenario can be catastrophic. And that's what we are trying to prevent. The good news is that we have preventive measures that are efficient and that they have proven to be you know, um, uh, helpful uh, to reduce uh, the spread of the disease. So, I mean, the spread of the virus. And that's what we are striving for. We want to promote also the preventive measures such as vaccination, such as for masking up, such as uh, a dis a social distance, because we know they are efficient and we want to help the healthcare system from this perspective. I wanted to start from that perspective, Dr. Rob, because it's also important that we share with the community that this is not only about the individual factors or the biological factors, but also about the social determinants of health that we need to keep into consideration when we talk about this pandemic. Yeah, so Kayla, what I would point out to the person who asked the question is that, you know, it does have some intuitive appeal to it, right? So if everybody had a very mild disease, was just a little bit of a cold, and then they were immune to the illness. Great, let's do it. The problem is that there's, there's really two problems with that. Number one is that you're not guaranteed to have a mild illness, particularly if you have risk factors for more severe disease. And so we are seeing people get severely ill, come into the hospital, and undoubtedly the death rate will start to rise uh, throughout the country. The second point is that we just really don't know what the natural disease-induced immunity is going to be with Omicron. And so, you know, with previous variants, when people had more mild disease, it's sometimes equated with less of a robust immunologic response and not being left with very protective immunity. We've also seen with disease-induced immunity that it can be very spotty. So some people can get a great robust immune response and other people have really very little immune response. So the best way, the most standardized and best approach to this is to get the vaccine, make sure that you have a, a robust response that's very predictive, very standardized, as opposed to the more spotty uh, disease-induced immunity that may not be very long-lasting. So I would uh, plead for people to you know, not have the chicken pox parties like we used to have mm -hmm. uh, with kids when we wanted to get everybody in the family immune to chicken pox. Uh, that's a bad approach when we have such a better a uh, way of approaching this, which is, you know, get the vaccine. All right, questions are flying in. We're going to try and get to as many of them as we can before 1 p.m. Um, can we talk about symptoms? Because we've seen those evolve with every strain. And some of the things that we've seen with the earlier variants, like uh, the loss of taste and smell, don't seem to be as obvious with Omicron. 
What symptoms should people be looking for right now? It's, it's pretty much the same as what we've seen with the, uh, the other variants. As you've already mentioned, it, it's a little bit more mild for people. So uh, less of the lower respiratory tract uh, symptoms of shortness of breath and then not being able to get enough oxygen and disseminated disease with more of a you know, uh, multi-inflammatory response, uh, sepsis kind of response. Uh, so we're seeing less of that, although there are cases of it. Um, and certainly the other symptoms of fevers, sore throat, headaches, nasal congestion, uh, cough, all of those uh, we continue to see. Uh, there may be a little bit less of the you know, perturbations of uh, taste and smell, uh, but I've not seen real reliable data on that at this point. I would like to compliment also when it comes down to kids or particularly babies, we need to look that uh, the babies don't have difficulty breathing. Like for instance, you know, like let's look at the chest and see if the if the muscles there are not being tied uh, more than usual because that the kid might or the baby might might be pro, uh, showing that they have difficulty breathing. Another thing to look at um, is at the diapers. If the diapers are dry, that actually it's raising the flag. So we need to seek for attention. So we're seeing these uh, you know specific elements with babies, and it's important to empower those parents because it does affect. The, the babies and the kids. So keep also an eye on, on, on the health of your children. They can't tell us what they're feeling when they're that age. So it's always good to look out for those clues. Thank you very much, Dr. D'Alba. Um, it almost feels like we're back to square one. We're scrambling to find the right masks. And once again, testing has been hard to come by. What do we know about how the tests basically can detect Omicron? And can we depend on things like home tests if we can even get home tests. Yeah, so uh, Kayla, I know people feel demoralized uh, by this most recent uh, variant. I guess I would try to emphasize that we are in a better spot than we were two years ago, quite clearly, okay? So we have an effective vaccine. We have some medications that are effective. We know so much more about uh, this illness and how it spreads, et cetera. So we're, we are in a better place. So don't be demoralized. Don't lose hope. Don't become fatalistic that uh, this is just going to uh, completely derail us. However, having said that, um, testing has been kind of a sore point from, from the very, very early days of the pandemic. And, um, you know, we did build up a more robust testing system. But then as we had the vaccine come in, uh, we really dismantled that. So here in Nebraska, for instance, uh, we really don't have as ready access to testing as we need. In addition, there's uh, differences between the tests. And I guess without getting into too great of detail, the rapid antigen tests uh, appear to be less sensitive, particularly in the early days of the disease. So they may be a little bit less reliable with uh, the Omicron. Uh, the PCR continues to be a very sensitive test, but it's a little bit harder to get access to. And then the other problem that I would point out is many of the home rapid antigen tests are really completely off the radar for public health. And you know we, we are not able to track those figure out where the patterns of disease are. So there's a lot of issues with regard to testing that we continue to work on. And I don't say this in any disparaging way to my colleagues in the laboratory. Uh, those guys have been working day and night for two years. I, I have the utmost respect and admiration for them. I think a lot of people are experiencing cases maybe within their community, their friends, their family members, where maybe one member has tested positive, other members can't get tests, or people have tested negative, but they feel like they have the symptoms. What are good guidelines for people if they have a case within their own home as far as isolating? How long should they do it? If one family member has tested positive, does that mean everybody stays home? Dr. Dalb, I'll let you take that one if you want. Absolutely. Well, it is important to have an open communication with the people who we are interacting. That's what we're actually, we were recommending during the Christmas season uh, or this holiday season to get around people who you know who they are, if they are vaccinated or not. So that's what we're in a certain way, not recommending to get surrounded by people who you don't know their vaccination status because it, it makes it difficult to track you know, if someone was in, uh, with symptoms or even positive. So um, my first recommendation would be to have an open communication with those people who you interact with, particularly if you go to a gathering or, a, or, a, or, or in this case, a, a reunion. So the other thing is that if someone comes with symptoms, you know, that um, actually that person 
simply will have to be isolated until you show that this person is not a, doesn't have a positive test. So the, the recommendation will be actually to get a test. PCR continues to be the gold standard as we were just talking, but if that is impossible and you know that you were in interaction with someone who uh, was positive or, uh, or was diagnosed with COVID-19 and you start to develop symptoms, you start to follow the recommendations of isolation. Contact your health department if you don't have access to a to, to a clinic or a hospital, because that is the, the, the situation of many of our community members. Contact the community health department and then follow the instructions because there will be a process of contact tracing and they will guide you to you know when you can return to, to the normal activities. We know we have protocols in place, you know, that, that the person who actually develops symptom knowing that this person or knowing that they, that they have COVID-19, um, that person actually remains isolated uh, for at least, well, there is, there are the, there are the guidelines of the CDC now recommends five days, but also it, now the new guidelines recommend a test in the, in the day number five and to see if the person comes positive, they, that person needs to remain five days more. If it comes negative, that person can consider or reconsider to come back to their activities, particularly if they are essential workers, because that's what the CDC guidelines are looking for, trying to balance, you know, our economy, the other factors that we that are important uh, for for our country, but also the health. And that's a constant challenge that we are facing, but at least we're trying to find that balance. And Dr. Rob, why don't um, I pass the microphone, uh, the microphone to you and, 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 and add what do you think it's appropriate? Yeah, sure. No, I think you did a good job in uh, summarizing uh, some good advice for people. Um, you know, I wish we had fast, accurate, readily available, cheap testing for everybody. Um, you know, that would obviously be the best situation, but that's just not reality. And so I think people are responding to that by sort of picking and choosing when they get tested. Um, I understand that. Uh, again, I would plead with folks if they are symptomatic um, to take themselves out of circulation, put themselves into isolation. Um, if they don't have a diagnosis, I think it's probably good to assume that they've had COVID right now because it is just so prevalent in the community. And so the best practice, as Dr. D'Alba said, you know, uh, put yourself in isolation for 10 days uh, before you come back out. Mm -hmm. If you're able to get that test at five days and it's negative, um, you know, people who do have to go back to work, if they do so, uh, please do that while you're wearing a mask. So those are the things that, that, that I would emphasize. And again, testing has been problematic. I wish we had a more robust system that uh, we could get people tested and get their results back within a few hours, but that's just unfortunately not, not what we're at right now. And one last comment real quick. If you see that your symptoms do not improve and get worse, seek for medical attention. A lot of people, some people have access, for instance, to, to oximeters and, you know, they, they have learned about how to use an oximeter. If you have that opportunity, you've had access to an, uh, to an oximeter and you check that your result is below 90, the saturation of oxygen, seek for medical attention because that's when you need to actually uh, receive other complementary uh, 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 approaches. I mean, um, uh, things that we can offer in the clinic or in, in the hospital. So I just wanted to also share this because it's a lot of, it's a, it's a, common, it's a common question I received from the community is particularly those who don't have a physician or access to healthcare attention. You know, the other issue is that there are other, there are other respiratory viruses that are circulating as well, including influenza. Uh, we have some good medications for influenza. So it does behoove people to get a test, figure out which virus they're infected with, because there are obviously differences in how we manage those. Mm -hmm. You actually segued me to the next question, and that is flu-rona. We are hearing about that this year. Last year, we saw virtually no flu with so many people isolating and masking, but this year we are seeing flu, and some people even having flu and COVID at the same time. Uh, how prevalent is that, and how is this impacting hospital capacity right now? Yeah, Kayla, I think you're right. Um, you know, last year we had a non-existent flu season, um, maybe partly due to the fact that people were putting these precautions into place. And also it's a, a lot due to just viral dynamics and how it interacts with the human population. We don't fully understand all those interactions at this point. Uh, we're not gonna get that lucky this year. And we're already seeing H3N2 influenza circulating in the community. Um, it can be a severe disease as well. You can have both of them together, and the data would suggest that if you do have a co-infection, that your outcomes are worse. 
uh, that doesn't really come as much of a surprise. Um, there is some information out there, believe it or not, that getting a flu vaccine actually has you do better uh, with COVID-19. And so there may be some immunologic interactions there that we don't fully uh, have understood, uh, but the, the data is, is um, fairly strong that getting that flu vaccine uh, may actually help you uh, cope with uh, COVID as well. So another good reason to get your flu vaccine and uh, already uh, you know, gave you the reasons for getting the COVID vaccine. We had already talked about, Dr. Dialba mentioned, um, people watching their oxygenation at home if they do have COVID and they are recovering at home. What other advice do you both have for people who are home, who don't necessarily feel sick enough to go to the hospital, but they're having a pretty rough go? What things can they do to help manage their symptoms? Dr. Dalma, why don't you go ahead? Yes, absolutely. Well, one of the, the, the key recommendations is to stay hydrated. Hydrated, a good, a good uh, a dietary habits. So having or consuming vegetables, fruits, that will help a lot, of course and also rest and isolate. Because I know it's tiring, I know it's challenging to stay uh, in four walls, but it's one of the most protect, uh, effective ways to protect others, particularly those who surround you. Now, there is a reality. There um, also, uh, as a large sector of our population, also live with a large uh, household. So a lot of the times they just have only one bathroom and they have to share it with other members. So. Again, it's important that when you have to go to common areas because of these needs, well, wear a mask, protect them. Keep into consideration that you have to protect those who surround you as well. It's not only thinking about or from the individual perspective, but it's also about thinking the people who surround you and who you love around. So Dr. Rob, I don't know if you would like to share something else. Yeah, I would completely agree. And trying to um, you know, do yourself uh, isolation, protecting your other family members is obviously critical. Um, you know, I would say taking a little bit of uh, acetaminophen, otherwise known as Tylenol or ibuprofen, otherwise known as Motrin or something like that is perfectly acceptable to help with the aches and the pains and the headache and the fever. Um, you know, if you're a high risk for progression, so you're elderly, you have underlying uh, cardiorespiratory disease, underlying immunosuppressive disorders, you've had an organ transplant, you're getting cancer uh, chemotherapy, you really do need to, to plug in with your medical professional. Uh, there are some things that we can offer as we've already talked about to try to prevent the progression of disease and we need to keep a close eye on you. So those are the people that I'm most concerned about. Otherwise, if you're healthy, you're more than likely going to be able to tough this out at home and we really don't want you to come screaming into the emergency department unless it's really an emergency. So, um, you know, if you're doing those things that your grandmother told you about, the uh, rest, fluids, a little bit of Tylenol, um, and you seem to be doing okay, then I would say uh, that's your best bet is just kind of tough it out at home for a few days. And I, and I would like to add something else. I keep bringing the, the, the focus of taking care of the, of the children. We understand that we cannot leave our children in four walls. So. Parents, this is a message, get vaccinated, get your booster, because you can be that person who can be the caregiver in case that your kid will need it. So in, in that situation, the parent, one of the parents can be that caregiver for the kid and take care of, these, uh, of your child. <clears throat> so again, it's important that we think also how we can protect the people who surround us, even the kids. We're getting close to one, and I know you're both very busy. I'm going to sneak in two more questions. We'll call it speed round. Um, a few of the questions have been coming in. Again, masks. A lot of us are using now the disposable surgical masks. How long is this good for? Dr. Rep, I think you can probably address this one for us. You probably don't want to wear the same one for days and days, right? Yeah, so again, the best respiratory protection is going to be well-constructed and fit tightly to the face. So these procedure masks do fairly well. And if you, um, you know, put some other kind of cloth face covering to hold it to your face, they actually function even at a higher level. If you can get your hands on the KN95, that's even a higher level of protection. And so now is an important time to be giving the, the best protection that you can muster. Um, as you said, when those masks start to get moist, uh, when they get uh, soiled or they start to tear, uh, clearly you want to uh, change out and uh, use a new one. Last question, kind of throwing it back to the beginning of COVID. Uh, people were kind of crazy with surface cleaning then. People were spreading out their mail and decontaminating it. And we were going crazy on doorknobs. 
Do we need to be as worried about that again with this contagious nature of Omicron, or is it mostly uh, being concerned kind of about masking and staying home? What would your recommendations there be? It's a respiratory disease, Kayla, and it's spread via a respiratory route. There can be some um, transmission from fomites or from environmental surfaces, but that's not where the emphasis needs to be. It needs to be on uh, source control, keeping people's secretions contained, and then uh, wearing your own mask to protect yourself. So those are the two most important things. Obviously, doing good hand hygiene, not touching your face. Uh, those are the things that can also help prevent the spread. Closing thoughts from both of you would be fantastic. Dr. Dalba, I'll let you go first. Thank you very much. Well, I will say that, you know, even though we're here speaking on behalf of the institution from Nebraska Medicine and UNMC, the message is that this combat against Omicron or SARS-CoV-2, who is which is causing the COVID-19 pandemic, does not start in the hospitals. That fight does not start in the clinics. That fight starts in the community. That fight that fight starts within our, our families. So everybody here plays an important role to end this pandemic. And to end this pandemic, we all need to be on board, regardless of race, nationality, preferences, and any other backgrounds. So thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward to seeing you the next time. Yeah, Kayla, thanks for giving me the opportunity. And I would echo those comments. I think this is a time when we need to pull together as a community with a unity of purpose. You know, it, it pains me so deeply to see these issues become politicized and become um, you know, something that tears us apart. This is a time when we need to come together as a community to protect one another and to do the right thing. So uh, please, you know, uh, knuckle down here for a few weeks, help us get through this. The hospitals are stressed. Uh, they're really just teetering on the edge at this point. Uh, we need everybody to do what they can to prevent the spread of this in the community right now. Dr. Rep, Dr. Dayalba, thank you so much for joining us today. We know you're extremely busy and getting that information straight to the community from our experts is incredibly meaningful. To all of you who have watched, thank you for taking the time today. Continue to put your questions in the comment sections and we will do the best we can to keep up with the answers. Uh, again, if you missed the beginning of this presentation, just wait a few minutes and you'll be able to watch it from the beginning. We'll also get it posted on our YouTube channel uh, so that you can share it as well. Again, thank you doctors for joining us and everyone please be safe out there. Thank you. Thank you.